What's going on, you guys? This is Kendall Williams, a loan strategist, here to help you to start taking action in real estate. And these are the eight steps to take action in real estate for 2023. So this is very huge. This is very big for your future as an investor, as a home buyer, as whomever that you are, whether you're ready to scale up or scale down, whether you're a renter and you just don't know where to start. So this is going to help you understand exactly where to start. So let's get started. Oh yeah, if you haven't done so, go ahead and subscribe to get some more information and I can help you progress this whole time in your future. All right, you ready to get started? Let's go. So step one is to check out my home buying guide. So if you check out my home buying guide, it'll tell you basically the 10 steps of how to buy a home and it will it will help you understand how the process goes. And if you just break down those 10 steps and then go read the frequently asked questions, those that will help you understand how to get started in real estate and it will help you understand what is the map and the journey look like whenever you just get started about trying to find out whether you can buy real estate, okay? So I would go ahead and get started with that. If you haven't done so, go ahead and like and subscribe. And that way, you, more people like you can get involved with this page. So if you check out the, the home buying guide, which I will actually provide in the links below. So go ahead and go get that. That way you're good and you're set, okay? So go ahead and do that. That way you understand the whole buying process and how to buy real estate and where do I even start and all of that. Now, these are the eight steps uh, prior to entering the loan transaction and prior to entering the real estate transaction. But I'm talking about the process after you get started, okay? So if you want to start there, that's awesome. Go ahead and get started there. Go ahead and download at the link below and I'll take care of you. So step two is to solidify your income. Okay, so there's pretty much three types of incomes that we actually look for. There's three types of incomes that we look at pretty much, which is W-2, self-employed or 1099, and then rental income. Now there's plethora of other incomes, but those are the big three, right? So with the W-2 or wage earner, I want you to really look at your last, the, the year end pay stub. So whenever you look at the year end pay stub, you'll see you have net income and gross income. So if you look at your gross income, you divide that by 12. That will actually tell you how much monthly income that you have that we will underwrite for. OK, so you can't just go based off of your net income because net income is after or after taxes. And we actually gross up before taxes. So that's what why we always do that. So then on the self-employed, I want you to look at your your taxes or your 1099 and I want you to go before you take deductions. So whenever you look at your 1040 or your 1099, your 1099 will probably tell you just like how the W-2 does or your pay stubs do. But for your actual, if you use your tax return as your way of um, telling the government you make income, then you need to look at your taxes. You see the net income that you have and then don't include any of the deductions. We don't include gas. We don't include, you know, the mileage and uh, all the meetings over food, we don't include any of it. For income, we include, you know, those big uh, one-time events that you have to pay, you know, $10,000 that you'll never pay that again. And it's because of something happened in your business that you need. So if it's like a one-time equipment use, then you, you will put that as a added back for your income. So I will actually give you a guide. If you want that guide, go ahead and click the link below. I will provide that for you, okay? And then rental income. Now with rental income, it's a little different. 
So with rental income, if you're buying your first investment property, then we're only going to use 75% of that income. We're only doing that just because that is the way underwriters and the investors write their guidelines like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae. Now, if you are not uh, buying it for your first time, we can actually use all 100% of that. So let's just say you have $2,400 on rental income every month. So that's $28,800 for the year. So, and that's on your lease. And if that is your first investment property, we're not going to use that $28,000. We're actually going to use the $21,600. And the reason is because, like I said, the investors use that. So that's your rental income. And, and you can actually use, let's just say you, you're buying an investment property. You can use your W-2 plus your rental income and combine the two. And that actually makes how much income you can qualify for for your, le your loan. That raises your uh, buying power. And that actually helps you out with finding the property that you want. So step three. Uh-oh. Step three is validating your credit. Now, I suggest you running your credit on annualcreditreport.com or each credit bureau. And I suggest doing that maybe one or two times a year. Annualcreditreport.com, I believe, is there's an unlimited amount of times now. But for each credit bureau, I think it's one time per year. So the way that you have to check it is by checking if the balances are correct, check if your payments are correct, check if you have any collections or any disputes or false accounts that are not real, then, then you need to get that, get rid of that because that will affect your credit score. So I'm going to give you an example. My, one of my clients came up to me and was like, hey, I really need to fix my credit. And I was like, okay, well, what's your credit score at? She said, well, it's, it's closer to 680, 690. Well, she actually, we actually ran her credit and she had a 563. And the reason was, is because she had a whole bunch of collections accounts all the way up to $37,000. And it's like, whoa, what happened there? And she didn't know. And all she had to do was reach out to each of those accounts account holders. And they said, oh, you only have a balance of $1,700 and you have a balance of $2,000. She got paid. She paid that off immediately. And her credit score went up all the way to 635. Now, that is not the case for everybody, but that is a case for her situation. And that was gave her the ability to buy a car and maybe later in the future, buy a home. Now, I want you to add all those monthly payments all together, including your court ordered or your government ordered debts. And then make sure you include your student loan payments. Now, with the student loan payments, even though they're in deferment sometimes or they're not, I want you to include them because we're going to include them on the underwriting guidelines. So, Whenever you include these payments, it's 1% of the balance. So if you have $100,000 worth of student loans, which, I mean, there's a lot of people out there with that, 1% is $1,000, okay? So make sure you just run that that way. Now, in, it depends on your certain program. You might be able to use a half percent or omit it completely. That's not always the case. That's why I always say the safer bet is to do 1%. And once you understand all of those payments together, you will add up all those monthly payments and there's your monthly payment obligation. Okay. Does that make sense? Make sure you comment below if that all makes sense. I want you to like comment in the section below and say, hey, this doesn't make sense or hey, it does make sense. Thank you for sharing this. Okay. Now, step four, I want you to budget your debt to income ratio. 
the first thing that you need to do is use your gross income from step two. We already talked about that. If you're having, if it's you and your spouse, I want you to combine the two. If it's, um, if you're buying a house by yourself and it's an investment property, I want you to use your income plus the rental income. And remember, only 75% of the rental income if you're buying a new property. And then I want you to multiply all of that income by 45%. And the reason why we do 45% is because most of the time, we're only going to go up to the maximum of 50% ratios. Now, once you go into underwriting, we can have a little bit more wiggle room and say, oh, we can do 49%. Oh, we can do 54%. Oh, we can do 60%. And that's all dependent on your loan program. Now, not everybody's going to be able to do the 60% a veteran. And they're not doing a VA loan. If you're doing a 55%, you have to do it in the FHA loans. Anything under 50% is usually conventional. Now, depending on your credit score, I want you to really focus on that. Depending on your credit score, you might have to have a lower that to income ratio. It might be closer to 45. It might be closer to 43. It's all dependent on you and your credit background. Okay, so you have, let's just, I'm like I said, we're just gonna do the safe bet and that's 45%. You multiply your income by 45% and that that gives you your, uh, your allowable maximum income that we can use. Now, after 45%, um, then you will subtract your monthly obligation because that 45% is saying, hey, this is the maximum debt to income ratio that we can actually do. That's not including your monthly debts. So if you only have a dollar worth of monthly debts, then subtract $1. If you have $2,000 worth of monthly debts, then subtract that 2000. Now I'm going to give you an example. So you got $10,000 worth of income and say it's just you. And that's multiplied by 45% because that's a safe bet. And then you have $1,000 worth of monthly obligation. I want you to subtract that from the $4,500 and that's $3,500 in more mortgage payment budget. Now your monthly mortgage payment budget that's the maximum number that you can go to for your mortgage for your mortgage payments. That's awesome. That's a, a lot of wiggle room. I've seen people get a couple houses with that type of wiggle room. Now, it isn't always the case for you, but if it is, please reach out. I would love to help you. So we have a debt to income sheet, cheat sheet. And um, so you have, you know, 60,000 divided by 12 is $5,000. 40% debt to income ratio is $2,000 and so on and so on. So I just want you to go through this. If you have any questions, please reach out. And that's like your annual household income. That's gross. And then that's your monthly household income. And then I want you to multiply that by whatever percentage. Okay. Does that all make sense? I hope it does. If it doesn't, please comment in the chat below and just say, Hey, this doesn't make sense. Please reach out. Okay. And then step number five, make sure your money is in order. So what I mean by that is you have to figure out where your down payment is coming from. Most people don't understand that it takes a little bit of time to uh, season your down payment. Uh, and what I mean by season, I don't mean salt and pepper or salt bay. I'm talking about, you know, having the money in your account for about 60 days. So anytime that you receive income, let's just say you got a bonus of $10,000 at the end of the year. 
we're going to look at that account and say, hey, where did this come from? And if it didn't come from, you know, your income or uh, another account of yours that you already had money in there for a long period of time, then we're probably going to question it because there's a lot of people that, you know, fund bad things such as terrorist groups or other sort of things. So we're not going to go into that, but that's the reason why we need your money this season. And that's why we ask, where is this money coming from? So you have to figure out where, whether you're com it's coming from checking and savings, whether it's coming from a big bonus, whether it's coming from retirement or uh, a gift from your parents or your loved ones. Um, and then we have to source those assets. And how we source it is whether it's going to be like, oh, it's going to be from equity. Okay, it's, it's from equity. Okay. No, it's not from equity. It's from cash or it's from a, de a deposit from this income. But we have to understand where you're going to get it from. So there's there's a couple ways to get it from retirement. You know, I already talked about that. That's basically like a cash asset. Um, or is it from... Uh, your checking and savings, again, that's like a cash asset. Or is it from equity? Equity can be, you know, pulled out from your home. Uh, a cash out refi can go up to 85% loan to value. So if you have $100,000, you can go all the way up to 85%, which is $85,000. Okay, so that's how much you can have um, taking out. Now, it just only depends on how much equity you have. So let's just say the house is worth $100,000 and your loan is $30,000. You can go up to 85%, which is $85,000. You're going to subtract the two, 85,000 minus 30,000, and that's 55,000. That's how much you can actually pull out for your equity. Now, I hope that makes sense because it's pretty much the same kind of process for HELOCs. You can go all the way up to 90 and 95% with HELOCs. Um, and then the other one is seller net sheets, because if you sold the home, you're gonna have a seller net sheet. That actually becomes your source or your season, right? For the money that you have in your account. And that way we're not gonna question it we're only going to see the seller net sheet and we're going to see the exact deposit. Okay. I hope that all makes sense. And then we have the gift of equity. And uh, that's whenever you're purchasing a house from your parents uh, or your loved ones. And it's basically a way for your parents to give you a gift or a down payment for your home. So let's just say, again, your house is worth hundred thousand that you want to buy um, your parents owe that thirty thousand dollars they're going to give you a gift of equity of twenty thousand dollars now that gives that replaces your down payment because your down payment is twenty thousand dollars you have to figure out how much is available well i know seventy thousand dollars is available they're going to get paid fifty thousand dollars still they're just giving you $20,000 and then they can still sell it for anything over a hundred grand, right? Now you have to run the numbers to whether it makes sense to do a refinance or to just buy it. If you're not gonna be able to qualify with the refinance, then I would just buy it. And I hope that makes sense, okay? Now here's a down payment cheat sheet. And with this down payment sheet sheet, I want you to really focus on the, the progression. So 3%, that's the conventional uh, first time home buyer program that allows you to put down 3%. Now you have to be within an income range of 80% AMI or area median income. So area median income is uh, how much the money, that zip code, uh, how much money is the median for that zip code? So let's just say I'm in Colorado. So I'll say 80129 uh, zip code is 
the median uh, uh, income is, let's just say, 100000 I'm just going to say 100000 So you have to be 80% or up to 80% to qualify for this. So that's $80,000. That's how much maximum your income can be. For 3.5%, that's usually an FHA buyer. An FHA buyer, you can make as much money as possible. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's just more about the down payment. Now, anything at 5, 10, 15, and even 3 and 3.5, three and you're going to be paying this thing called mortgage insurance. So mortgage insurance is something that allows the government to have a backed asset. So whenever you have this backed asset, that allows you to, you know, uh, put a down payment of 5% and then the government is backing that, that loan and says, hey, if this person defaults, you're still going to get paid. And that's what mortgage insurance is about. It's kind of the same thing as, you know, life insurance. You're paying a premium to then say, if you pass away, then you're, the people who are inheriting that life insurance will be paid out, whatever that uh, premium was offered. So hopefully that all makes sense. So 20%, that is how much uh, you have to put down to not have mortgage insurance. So to not have mortgage insurance, that's, um, which is a huge cost to some loans. It can be upward of $30, uh, $300. It can be upward of $350. It's all dependent on your loan amount and how much you actually can put down. Okay. So now step six, let's put together the payments. And I have a calculator um, that you can run by yourself. I have the link below it, <laughs> below this YouTube. Okay. I have this video. I have this link below this video and I want you to go Go figure it out yourself and just go type it in and make sure the maximum housing expense percentage is at 45% because then you won't be a lot, like if you put it higher or lower, then you're, the, the numbers won't make sense to you. And you're either going to overshoot or make it lower. So make sure you run those numbers um, and figure it out yourself. That way you can say, huh, this doesn't really make sense. And I don't want to, you know, this is a, this is a way to like map it all out. Instead of just doing it by hand, you can do it all here. Okay. And then step, step number seven, I want you to rebalance. And what that looks like is if you're not happy with the result, then make sure you lower the purchase price or bring a bigger down payment, which lowers your loan amount or pay off some debt, fix your credit, add somebody else to the loan. And that somebody else can be anybody. They just have to understand that they're obligated to pay the loan back. And I hope this all makes sense. So step number eight, I want you to follow me. Follow me, follow me, follow me. These are all my platforms. If you liked my stuff, please like this. That way, I, I, the algorithm can pick up that I am trying to spread valuable information to other people like you. Okay, so follow me on Instagram. Instagram, you're going to have a lot of shorts, uh, a lot of short videos, and it's kind of entertaining. On YouTube, it's more of my educational content. Um, LinkedIn is kind of my, uh, I would say, you know, uh, professional me. Uh, so you're going to have a better videos. Um, and then on TikTok is kind of entertainment. And then Facebook is going to be similar to Instagram. Um, and then you can find all my links on Linktree. So if you go to Linktree, you can follow me everywhere. And that's where you're going to get all my content. I have some free content towards the bottom. And if you just press in those links, I'm sure you'll have a great time. So then here's a way that you can contact me directly. So here's my number um, and my email. Please reach out if you have any questions. Um, and if you don't have any questions and you're ready to start today, 
hey, go ahead and click the kindlewilliams.novahomeloans.com and then press apply now. And when you press the apply now, just fill out the application. It'll give me all your numbers and you'll be all set to get started. I thank you so much for watching today. It has been a pleasure adding value in your life. Make sure you follow, like, and subscribe. It's been a blessing, man. Kendall Williams, Alone Strategist here. Peace.